evening and welcome to tonight to, to tonight's master gardener program about the spotted lanternfly. I'm Dina Henschen, adult services librarian at Gum Spring Library and your host today. Please feel free to send me your comments and questions during the program by using the chat feature and I will relay them to Beth during and after the program. Beth Sastry is the commercial horticulturist for the Loudoun Extension Services Virginia Cooperative Extension. Beth is originally from Mexico and has obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy with a minor in horticulture and a master's degree in human nutrition and post-harvest physiology. Beth worked for Mexico's government's programs focusing on supporting marginalized farmers and conducted research and extension education for five years. In 1999, Beth came to the USA and for 10 years, she worked as a full-time mom and then started a gardening business. In February 2013, she joined the Loudoun County government where her work experience includes, but is not limited to horticulture, propagation, entomology, fungi, microbiology, post-harvest physiology, extension and educational programs. Welcome Beth. Thank you, Dina. Good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us on this rainy night. Uh, with me is uh, Becky Hutchins and Becky Hutchins is a master gardener volunteer and without her help, you know, uh, may, uh, many of these programs focus on spider lanternfly wouldn't be possible. So I'm going to start now uh, with the. Beth, we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. So you didn't hear anything? No, we didn't hear anything. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. Um, let me go here then. So uh, I was mentioning that I want to uh, also introduce Becky Hutchins. He's, she's a master gardener volunteer and uh, without help, help, help uh, this uh, program of awareness for experimental fly will be possible for extension office. So most of the time you will see experimental fly as a SLF. Uh, this is an insect that is spreading very rapidly. It's highly destructive. Um, the way it, it lays down the eggs is very hard to find them, and you know you know you have to have a, a expert eyes to identify. Uh, there is a management, but the management is expensive and is time consuming. Uh, we also have a future in biocontrol, which has been on research since uh, 2014. Um, and what we are going to be asking you from now on is take a picture, kill it and report it. So what is a spider lanternfly? This is a plant hopper, meaning it jumps from one type of plant to another type of plant. It's originally from China, and it was found in Pennsylvania in 2014. It came on crates that were holding rocks. It was found in Virginia in 2018, specifically in Winchester, and it survived the polar box vortex temperature that it was, you know, uh, minus 24 Celsius um, is polyphagous, meaning it feeds from different type of plants. It is a phloem feeder, meaning that it will feed from the sap of the plants and it prefers the tree of heaven. The uh, spider lanternfly nymphs climb into uh, trees after hatching. If you want to uh, touch it or you want to uh, get them, it, um, it will move very rapidly and also repeatedly falls to the ground and then it comes back to the foliage. As they mature, they stay longer in one type of tree. They have a many type of hostages and is more restrictive while the insect reaches maturity. How is spreading? So the, it has two types of spreading. One is the surge 
short range and the other one is a long range dispersal. The short, uh, short range dispersal is mainly fly hopping and walking. Uh, it's known that it can spread by itself around 10 miles per year. And the long range dispersal, which is the one that is having the major uh, consequences, is human movement of infesting commodities or egg masses, and also is a great hitchhiker near major points of industry, especially the uh, railroads. Um, as I said, it's a very good hitchhiker, and mostly when it is adult, and on it will uh, attach on anything that is outdoors, and also it will lay the eggs on, uh, eggs on everything, all the outdoor uh, equipment, um, everything that you keep out, outdoors, it will attach, uh, attach there or lay down the eggs. And then we accidentally will move it from one place to another. And also on plants, so uh, let's say nurseries, uh, if they have, um, eggs lie down on plants and then it hatches and then you go to the nursery and, and you will start uh, moving them from one place to another. As I mentioned, uh, spiral antifly was found in 2014 and it started in Berks County in Pennsylvania. Um, it was found in high numbers, which is thought that it initially arrived in 2014, uh, 12, I'm sorry. 2012. So when they discovered in 2014, a population was already established. When we said a population established, established is that they found egg nymphs and adults. Um, it was found in a rock, rock jar, and it was the first report from the New World. So uh, integrated pest management program uh, based on Cornell has a monthly map where it, uh, um, you will see what is reported for spiral lantern flight. So you may see some uh, purple uh, dots, and it means that it was a in individual that was found there, but there is not infestation. And as we need to remember if infestation is when they have found eggs, names, and adults at the same time in one point. Then you're gonna see that, um, there are uh, counties and, um, um, that are on blue, and those counties on blue are where the infestation is present. And then you're going to see a red, a you will see a red line around some counties, and that means that that, is, that county is in quarantine. Um, this map also helps people to figure out what they need to do when we are going from one place to another place. So let's say we are in Loudoun County, as you may see, uh, you, as you can see, there is uh, no report of individual uh, present in Loudoun County yet. As I said, is there, we haven't found any, we haven't had any report. It doesn't mean that it, it, it's not here. It may be here, but we haven't found it. But let's say we are going from here to Winchester, um, we may want to buy plants or a, um, equipment or something uh, uh, like that. So uh, Winchester, you see, is in quarantine. And I will explain what quarantine means, but it, it mainly what I wanna say with this one is, before you travel to another county or state, please look at this map and see what is going on with the spiral lantern flight. So this is the status of spiral lantern flight in Virginia in January, 2022. As I mentioned, you know, we have three counties that are in quarantine right now, and we have uh, small isolated populations in other counties, especially along Route 81, which is one uh, from where all the, uh, you know, um, tractor, I'm sorry, uh, transportation, main transportation uh, way for a uh, or a, the, when we move commodities from one place to another. So A1 is one of the ones that, a, along A1 is when we have been found in spiral lantern fly. And you will see that in Prince William also, spiral lantern fly has been found, and it was also along the railway. So these maps shows the potential distribution of spiral lantern fly in the United States. And it takes in account different parameters. Um, 
temperature, humidity, and also the distribution of uh, the tree of heaven, which we will talk uh, uh, more in detail, but tree of heaven is an invasive, non-native invasive uh, tree, which came from um, China as well. Uh, as you can see, the red color means that is a higher, uh, uh, higher suitability for the spread of a uh, spot and lanternfly, and you know we are on one of those hot spots. Um, also, uh, it's not just the tree of heaven, but all their secondary hosts that spot and lanternfly provides. So now you can see the list of a uh, spot and lanternfly host in Virginia. Uh, there are about 45 different hosts that have been identified here. The main hosts are Tree of Heaven, grapes, and grapes can be the cultivator or the wild grapes, walnuts, maples, cherries, and anything next to the Tree of Heaven. And please take a look at this list, and um, I think you will identify several of these trees that uh, and plants that you may have in your yard. So be aware that those are plants that can attract spot and lunch of light. And those are the places where we have to be scouting frequently. I have a question for you. Somebody's asking, do you think this cold weather may kill some? No. <laughs> no, but because right now, um, you're going to learn about the, the life cycle of spiral lunch of fly. And right now, they hibernate and, uh, um, as an egg. And as I said, the polar vortex did not kill the eggs. So, no, it will not. Let me see what, what happened. Um, so you saw the beginning, I'm sorry, let me go back to this one. Uh, wherever you see an E next to the name of the plant, uh, it means that egg masses were found. And it may not be a true host, it's just that spider lanternfly la loves to uh, lay down eggs anywhere. So it doesn't mean, you know, that they would prefer that specific plant to lay down eggs. But it's where, it, you know, that is some of the records and that are records that uh, we can take in account in order uh, to do research. So on this uh, table, you see the key plant host of spider lanternfly. Um, you will see that we have rose, grapes, wild and cultivated, tree of heaven, black walnut and butternut, river birch, willow, sumac, and silver and red maple. Just think about, you know, how many of these plants uh, and trees you have at home. So then you will see uh, next to the host list, you will see that there we have the division between nymphs and adults. And can, you can see that there are two plants, uh, one, the grapes and tree of heaven, that are the ones that they will, a uh, spiral fly will prefer as a nymph and as an adult. So those are the hot host for spiral lanternfly. Uh, and then we have the river beach, willow, sumac, and silver rock maple. And one of the purposes of for me to show this is that if you have any of these plants, trees at home, just, you know, once in a while, take a look at it and look for the spiral line to fly. So, as I mentioned, Tree of Heaven is a um, non-native invasive tree that came from China and is number one preferred than grapes. Um, then the question is, is Tree of Heaven required to sustain spider lanternfly populations? And the answer is not. Uh, Tree of Heaven has some alkaloids that spider lanternfly like, 
when they feed from the sap of the tree of heaven, they are going to pass on those alkaloids to their uh, gener next generation. What happened with alkaloids, they taste very awful. So native uh, predators, parasit uh, predators that we have here in, in, in the United States are not used to that. And therefore, they will not pee on the spider lanternfly. The other thing is because this is a tree that is invasive, non-native, most of the efforts on, con on management or controlling its spider lanternfly has been on the management of Tree of Heaven. Um, and as I said, you, you saw that there is an extensive list of plants that spider lanternfly will like. So uh, there are other uh, trees and plants that can support the development of the spider lanternfly all the all on during the whole life cycle. And these are black walnut, silver maple, willow, grape, both the um, cultivated and the wild, south of oak and china berry. And then we said, can spider lanternfly reproduce without the tree of heaven? And if so, is insect fitness reviews. So yeah, spider lanternfly can reproduce uh, without the tree of heaven. Uh, can we say that the, the, the health of the uh, insect is reduced? It's not. Uh, what is, uh, based on the research, what is known is that the tree of heaven will pass on the alkaloids. And that way, as I mentioned, you know, there are not many uh, insects that will prey on those. Uh, the important thing is that, you know, having a variety of plants and trees for a, the, the spider lanternfly to feed on is what gives them optimal fitness. So here I you have a question for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have a question from one of our uh, viewers. Um, has this been impactful yet on the Loudoun County's great business? <laughs> Uh, no, yet we, I haven't found it on any of the vineyards that I've been placing traps. Um, so if we find it here or when it comes here, uh, uh, we found it there, it is going to be hard to control it. Uh, because, uh, this is something like brand marmorate sting bug or like, um, Japanese beetles. So you see that they come in big amounts every day. So for a vineyards, it's not possible to spray every day. It's against the regulations for pesticide application. And, and I will explain a little bit more about pesticides, but it, it will impact. And, and it's not just the, the farming or the agricultural area. It's also gonna impact the suburban area. And that's what is very important for you to everything that you learn today to pass on to your friends and your and anybody in your community. So here you have the, one more question. Go ahead. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I have one more question, but but before you continue, um, if the spotted lanternfly feeds on plants other than the tree of heaven, is it more appealing to predators taste wise? If um, we have seen some predators that um, have been feeding on spider lanternfly, but as I said, the problem is once spider lanternfly reach adulthood, they will look for tree of heaven, especially females, because that's where they are going to get those alkaloids that will make them untasteful, and they they um, they will protect themselves by doing that. And then once their their the nymphs hatch or the eggs hatch. Uh, those are going to be as untasteful as the adult because they already have the alkaloids. So uh, the problem is that Tree of Heaven is everywhere. And um, I want to show you some pictures of Tree of Heaven. And as I said, you know, this is one of the, uh, we call it cultural controls for spider lanternfly is to destroy Tree of Heaven. Because at least if we destroy them, the spider lanternfly will keep uh, reproducing but it will not taste bad. 
So many other predators that, uh, you know, uh, they predate on other pests will start feeding on spider lanterfly. Any other questions? Thank you. I did get one. I did. Yeah, I did get one more question, and then we'll let you keep moving. No, no, forward please. You know, I, I appreciate that you are interested, <laughs> so I, I don't mind. Please, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Um, are the vent are the vintners on hyper alert and know what to look for? Yes, and not just the the, the owners, but I I train the all the agricultural workers because they are the eyes of a uh, the, the you know in the field. And in the vineyard, so yes, they are. Any other question? No, nope, that's it for now. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. So, please pay close attention to this one. Uh, you will see that X will appear from October to June, and then, oh well, they will be laid down on October to June. Then they will start hatching. Uh, a, on May, from May to June, and we call it the first instar. And the difference between the first, second, and third is just the size. They are super tiny when they first hatch, and then they start growing. So the first instar will be from May to June. Then we have the second one from June to July. Then the third one from June to July as well. And I just say, you see, it's, it's black with white. However, this is going to be almost impossible for a non-trained eye to identify it. After the third, we have the four instar, and this is uh, from July to September, and you will see that uh, it changed color, so it's going to be red with white and black dots. Then we're going to have the adults from July to December, and it's a pretty, will you say that it's a moth? It's not a moth, it's not a fly. Is it belongs to the same family than the cicadas, so you will see a pretty insect like cicada like with a red and white and gray and cream wings and also black. And then you will start seeing laying eggs, um, uh, spiral fly legs, eggs during sep from sep uh, September till December. So I, I'm saying, you know, let's go. Uh, be very aware of the, the times of the year when the life cycle happens, because I have had people calling me uh, on May saying that they saw an adult of a spiral lantern fly. Do you think that this is possible? No. And during May, they are starting hatching. So we cannot find adults on May. And this is just one generation per year. So this picture, I took it in 2020 in Winchester. We were uh, helping with experiments from Virginia Tech and Virginia State, uh, I'm sorry, and the Virginia Department of Agriculture. And you will see that in those uh, circle, yellow circles that I, I mark, there are egg masses, which uh, are very hard to find with a naked eye and with a naked and non-trained eye. Um, you will see that the eggs that are on on the higher part of that trunk have uh, like a, some openings, elongated openings. That means that those are already hatched. Uh, there are some on the lower end of the tree that uh, are just, it looks like a clay that was just spread there, and those haven't hatched. Another thing is that Spider lanterfly likes to it likes to lay down eggs on the same places where they did it last year. Um, each spider lanterfly can lay between three and five egg masses, and each egg masses may have between fifty and eighty eggs. So, is the the reproduction is exponentially. So here is a very fresh egg mass. It was their first found in, um, uh, yeah, it was first found in September 17. And when they lay down, when it's a fresh egg mass, it looks like a white clay, and then uh, it's very bright. And then the colors start changing to gray, or a brown, like a light brown 
but it also sometimes it, it looks like a, it mimics the color of the surface where it has been laid down. Um, you will see on the picture of the lead, the left a, ma a, a an egg mass that was a, taken first on a picture on, the, on November 2015, and then you will see that on March 2016. So you. you a, once the spiral lanternfly starts laying down the eggs, it covers that with a wax surface uh, uh, substance. Um, it, at the beginning, it looks like a wax, and then after a um, few months, starts looking like a clay, and it weathers with the temperature, the rain, um, it starts cracking, but the eggs is, are viable. So mostly the egg masses are one and a half long, and one and a half inch long by one and a half, by half or three quarters wide. And uh, these started appearing. Um, this was taken on, uh, this, you will see the egg masses in mid-October to April. So here I have more pictures of egg masses. You will see on the first one, the top of the left, um, they start weather it, um, weather it, and then they are cracked. And the second one on the bottom, you will see that you know there is no uh, protection, and they are exposed. And also you will see some openings that are uh, elongated. So that means that the uh, spiral lanternfly already hatched from those one. Um, as I said, you know, it's hard to identify a spiral lanternfly egg masses, but hopefully you will be an expert. If you see that the openings are elongated, it means that uh, they already hatch. However, there are some egg masses with eggs that have a circular opening. That circular opening means that there is a tiny wasp that already Parasit uh, uh, is parasitizing that egg or a real hatch. So there, uh, this is a type of biocontrol. I will uh, talk about that later. But if, if you see a round opening, that is good because that is a, a, a wasp that emerged from that egg. On the picture of um, your right, you will see that uh, there is a spiral lanternfly mass. And at the end, uh, the covering was applied radically. Most of the time that happens when they are laying the last uh, eggs, like uh, egg masses. So as I said, they, they can lay between three and five egg masses per female. So at the very end, it's like a, they are running out of that cover material that uh, helps protect the egg. So I these a couple of questions for you, Beth, if you have a moment. Of course. Uh, one qu one question is: Is there a preferred side of the tree for the eggs, north facing versus south facing, etc.? Very good question. Yes, they prefer the north facing. That way, you know, the sun is not hitting them because the sun can dehydrate the eggs. So yes, uh, mostly it will be on shaded areas, especially north. And for example, you know, when we when we talk about a uh, looking for spiral lanternflies um, on trees. Most of the time, you know, when we, when we think that we visualize that we are gonna see it like at the height of our, you know, our height. However, just 10% of spiral lanternflies are found at um, human height. The rest are on top of the canopy or, or the middle, but you know, it's hard to see them. And they will be on areas that are uh, shaded or more humid. And then I have a question: um, Were all the egg masses that you're seeing that we're seeing in the slides have they been destroyed? <laughs> uh, well, these were taken in Pennsylvania, and you know, uh, is is a good practice. But once you have you have it there, is is difficult to do that. We ask for people you see it, you know. Take a picture, destroy it, and if you put it, you can put it in a plastic bag, put it.
but uh, for example, doing this in commercial uh, in a commercial setting is super expensive. Uh, so for commercial producers, we have some different approaches. It's good if they see them, you know, kill them, smash them, but it's not like a, they are going to send a whole crew, especially to smash all the egg masses. It's extremely expensive. As a homeowner, please do it. But for a, for farmers, it's going to be it, the approach is different. So these pictures were taken in Pennsylvania, and if you Google uh, Clark, uh, I'm sorry, Burke County, Pennsylvania, spiral lanternfly, or just spiral lanternfly, Pennsylvania, you will be amazed of all the videos that you will see. Um, spiral lanternflies are like a flies flying around a cow. That's how they 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 get that, that bad. So on the first picture on your left, you, it's a rock. And they lay down the eggs there. So I said, you know, they don't care uh, where they lay down the eggs. The eggs will survive. They don't need to see. They are uh, hibernating and growing uh, and forming the the spiral So they, you will be, you will see them in concrete. On concrete, uh, you see them here on wood, on on plastic. So they they don't care where they they lay down the eggs. Uh, do we have another question? No, nope, that's it for now. Okay, so more pictures here. You see that is a wood, more rocks. Uh, they love rusted metals. Um, uh, we have seen them, as I said, you know, along the railways, um, trucks, rusted trucks, and, and that was a, a truck that was left at, alongside of the railroad, and we were there, and, and even the tires on the tires, Spiral Lanternfly was uh, laying down the eggs. Uh, you see on that T post on a, a vineyard, um, that's another place, and the, and the barrel. So, you know, for that one, it's easy to see them, but um, once they are on the tree, it's super hard to find them. Here, can you see them? So, this is a concrete that has been weathered, and you start seeing the tiny spiral lanternflies hatching. Uh, so, in in 2019, the first hatch was seen in, on, April, on April 27th. And then on the picture of the right, you will see all the tiny spiral lanternflies uh, running away. And the truth is, it's very cool to see them because when they start hatching, and I seen that, you know, it's like a soldier walking all of them together, finding uh, the best spot for them to start feeding. So here, as I mentioned, these are the three different instars of spider lanternfly. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the size are, uh, are, are very, very small, for a uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch long for the first instar, one quarter of an inch for the second, and then three eighths of an inch for the third instar. As, and, um, you know, the, the, the only difference on uh, the, um, these three instars is the size. They are going to be exactly the same color, but the size. And they we will start seeing them from May to June. Uh, one thing that we have noticed since 2018 is that almost every year, or, you know, every year, the hatching has happened at least five days before the previous year. What do you think? Why? What do you think the reason is for this? Is global warming is getting hotter and hotter? So uh, there is something that we call degree days. Um, every human, every living organism responds to degree days, and is the number of degree days, um, the average of degree days, that happen from the moment that the year starts. This is a, a little bit uh, complex um, definition, but it's how hot it gets. And every every insect or human uh, or living organism ha has a number of degree days where different phenology starts happening. It's, it's like a life uh, changing from one stage to another. So uh, for spiral lanternfly, I think it's 200. 
So these 200 degree days have been reached every year one um, about four days before or, or more, almost a week before the previous year. So on this one, um, as I mentioned, you know, when they start hatching and uh, in the nymphal, small, uh, the first three nymphal stages, they hop and they fell down from the surfaces. And it's because on their legs, they haven't developed the aerolium, which is like a spongy and hooky uh, structure that helps them to attach very well to surfaces. So on, on the bottom, you will see these are um, pictures that were taken on a microscope, electronic microscope, um, where the aerolium is developing. So it's, it's, it's very cool to see this one. And that is the reason why when they are a, in the first, second, and third in info stage, they fell, fall, they fall down from the surfaces because they cannot hold on very tight till they develop that uh, aerolium very well. So here we see the uh, where the immature st uh, stages can be found, and it usually is on stems, like a very juicy material, because it's, it will be easy for them to um, take the sap from the plants. And this is one where uh, it's leaving the ex exoskeleton and is morphing to the fourth lymph nymphal stage. Oh, by the way, that plant where is it, it is is the tree of heaven. Um, and look at the on the base of the leaves, there are two structures um, that are like a tiny dots. And mainly is where the, the smell of the tree of heaven uh, is produced. And it smells like a burnt peanut butter. So here we see that um, the four inch star is about seven eighths of an inch. And uh, this was found on June 26 and 2020. And again, on the first and second picture, they are on a uh, tree of heaven. Then we have the Sparanantrophy adult that is about one inch long. So this one is easy to see, and we can find them from July to November. So at this time, also, we found names of other insects uh, that are very common in our environment. And people will say, hey, I found a nymph uh, around July, um, August. I found a nymph of Sparanantrophy. Around that time, we may have some, but it's not like a, we are going to have a lot of them. Okay, we will see more adults. So here you see that um, first it laid down the eggs and then it starts covering with that waxy surface. Um, and it looks very white at the beginning, white and shiny. So here we have two specimens. Uh, you may see that on the specimen of the right, at the bottom of the abdomen, there is a red structure. And that is called gonapothesis. And gonapothesis is a structure that helps push out the eggs of the female. So that one is a female. Males do not have that structure. Therefore, they don't have that red color. So this is a publication. Beth, I have a question. Go ahead. Beth, I have a question. Um, can the instars be squished with your hand? Oh yes. Any any, any stage, even you know, this part of the, the adult, you can do that. And I'm gonna show you some a, a picture where uh, Vic and I are comparing the ways we squish them. Yes, but you can do that. They are gonna they are not gonna sting or they are not gonna bite humans or pet, pets. They don't do anything to us, it's just to the uh, plants. So this is a publication that we have, Virginia Corporate Extension has Virginia Tech as well, it's the same. And we show the different life stages and when that is happening. 
And as I said, this is very important because that way, you know, if you, if, if, if you see something, if you see something that looks an adult during April, I'm sorry, during May, obviously it's not going to be the sparrow fly because in May we still have the names. And on the first uh, picture where the egg masses are, you can see that there are very old egg masses that are already hatched. And then we have others that, you know, uh, the second one from the one that has the opening is uh, the second oldest. And then we go around against the clock uh, and you will see that the newest one is on top of the, the one that was laid down uh, last year. So as I said, you know, once they, 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 they lay down eggs in one place, next year they are gonna do it there. And mostly what uh, uh, researchers have seen is that they will stay there uh, for about three years because they find that uh, they found that there is a suitable place with a host that will feed them um, in, in a very healthy way because they have a different type of host and they will stay there for three years then till they start uh, weakening that host. So the nutrient flow is not going to be the same. So they will look for other, uh, other places where they have a host available. So what is the risk from spotter fly? Is a feeding damage, which will cause economic impact. Uh, it's going to be a nuisance because after um, you know, they start feeding, they will produce honeydew Sooty mall, yeast, and bugs. And you will see that on um, another uh, slide uh, that I have here. And also, the news is, is that uh, businesses have to comply with quarantine. And we as a homeowners, we don't have to comply with a quarantine. However, we are required to look, if we, if we are uh, in a place that is quarantined before moving anything that has been outside, we are asked to look for a spider fly, any life stage of them. And also, if, for example, if you travel to Winchester, please be very careful. Right now, you know, we don't have any risk of adults moving from one place to another, but egg, egg masses that have been laid down on any, anything that has been let, left outside. So let's say you, you think, you see that a, uh, Home Depot in Winchester may have a, a sale on grills, and then you think that you want to, you said you want, I want to buy a grill before bringing it, please check it everywhere because Sparrow flies may have like eggs on that. And, and uh, Sparrow has been uh, in Lowe's and Home Depot in, in Winchester, so have been identified there. So please. Any time that you go to Winchester and other counties where spider lantern fly has been identified or they are in quarantine, check everything before coming. And as again, I, I said, you know, right now, adults are not, um, you are not going to see adults, but egg masses. So how does it feed? Um, spider lantern fly feeds on sap. And, and the sap is like a, our blood. It, hold, it carries on nutrients from the roots to all the way up uh, the leaves and then, you know, and also water. So they feed from those. Um, they do not suck, but they utilize the, uh, they use the gravity of the, of the flow. And that's, you know, when a, uh, when a plant is very healthy, the flow of that uh, sap is, is very good. So they just insert the person sucking mouth part, which is that one. And it's that, it's that strong that can penetrate, you know, trees like uh, maples, black walnuts, black, wal uh, black locusts. So it can go through that and reach the vascular system, which is like our veins. And the vascular system is where the sap goes uh, on the plant. And then what do you think that happens after it has been feeding from the sap? 
example, is going to excrete something that is called honeydew. And honeydew is a water that has sugar. Um, and what happened when there is honeydew on the plants? Okay, so there is um, bees, ants, um, tiny flies, they will feed on them, on the honeydew, because it's sweet. So uh, initially in Pennsylvania, people started complaining about uh, many bees and flies and ants on their plants. And the reason it was not them, it was, uh, it was not initially the, the bees or the ants. Uh, the problem was because spider lantern fly was there and was feeding so heavily that it excreted a lot of honeydew and then they will harvest in the honeydew. Also, after honeydew is excreted, because it's sugary, a sooty mold is going to form. And this is type of a, a fungi. And sooty mold is going to make everything that was honeydew is going to be black. Honeydew is, is crystalline, like amber. But once sooty mold starts growing on it, it's going to be black. And you may have seen that also with white flies and with aphids. You see that, you know, when there is a high amount of honeydew, it starts uh, turning black, and the black means that there is mold growing on it. After mold is growing on it, you are going to see a uh, gist forming, and on the picture of your left, you're going to see at the bottom a white color, which is the gist, and it smells like fermentation. It's, it's really strong. So what is going to happen in the forest when you have a lot of honeydew and then sooty mold and yeast. What happened is because the, the sooty mold forms, a, when it starts developing, it is black. Photosynthesis starts to lower them. And as we all know, photosynthesis is the way that plants produce their own food. So you will see a decline on the forest floor or any plant where honeydew has been deposited and sooty mold is growing. So what does it mean quarantine for me, homeowner? Um, it means that regular items can, cannot be moved unless you meet certain criteria, criteria. And let me tell you something, there is no one that is gonna be looking at you saying, hey, you need to look for the spider lantern fly, uh, any life cycle on this uh, furniture, uh, outdoor furniture that you are gonna give away or that you are gonna move to your kid's uh, house not, nobody's going to be doing that, uh, but you know, it's, it's the, our responsibility to to learn to slow the spread of spider and lantern fly because it's not just going to affect the rural area; it's going to affect the suburban and urban area. Um, and it's also, you know, the, this all the commercial businesses, you know, they will have to inspect this. Uh, all the, art, the everything that is outside. So what are the best management practices for spider lantern fly? Always look, for, look out for the egg masses and insects. And as I said, you know, this is gonna be very hard for you to identify egg masses and also to identify nymphal stages, especially the, the first, second, and third. Um, scrap out or smash egg masses and kill the insect. Use a sticky tape, we call it bending, on high risk areas. I'm going to talk more about this. Um, and then also use alternative traps, uh, alternative traps, which we call it circle traps. Uh, I will tell you when is we recommend either one. Uh, use uh, control the tree of heaven and use sentinels to monitor. What it means is first you need to identify tree of heaven. And then a uh, tree of heaven, uh, we have male and female. We recommend to kill all the females and leave one healthy male, uh, which diameter is more than six inches. We are going to use it as a sentinel to monitor that. And that on that tree is where we put the circle traps. Uh, this is very expensive uh, because uh, control the uh, tree of heaven requires you to use in, uh, herbicides. And also, you need to know how to use herbicides. 
uh, and then you will have to apply it one year and then the following year. You cannot just cut tree of heaven and kill it. If you do that, you are gonna promote more trees to sprout from those roots. The roots have a lot of carbohydrates that will make them a, have like, it's like a bamboo. You cut it and you don't spray anything and any, any herbicide, they will come back at hundreds of them. Um, then don't park under trees when you, when you know that you are going to Winchester, and I, I always say Winchester because we have a lot of people coming back and forth from Winchester, don't park under the trees because they are gonna be there. Um, when we are gonna control it, we use something that is called integrated pest management, and that will tell us what is the less toxic approach. And then if there is a confirmed site we ask you to report it to our um, office and you can just go to Loudoun County's pattern lantern flight. And if you if you just type that pattern lantern flight Loudoun County, you will see the report uh, form. If somebody is joining us from other counties or uh, other states, you can do the same pattern lantern flight extension or a Department of Fly, Department of Agriculture in Maryland, in West Virginia, and you will find a, a, the link to report it. If you are not sure that this is Spartan Land of Fly, uh, please contact Loudoun County, uh, Loudoun County Master Gardeners. And as I said, every county in every state has Master Gardeners. So if you are in Maryland, Montgomery County, look for Montgomery County, uh, uh, Maryland Master Gardeners, and they can help you. So I said integrate pest management. This is something that um, you may have never heard of it, uh, but it's very common. And is, is to use all the tools in the toolbox to control pests. And it's not just one technique or one approach that is gonna help us to control, it's all of them combined in a very sustainable way. So as a pyramid, the first one is cultural. And in this case, okay, we know that what, what are the hosts of spiral lantern flies. So try to, for example, a tree of heaven, if you can, a, that is the first approach is to kill tree of heaven. Um, also, we know that there are some plants that they prefer more. So if, if that is something that you can avoid, uh, do it please, because when we have it here, it's gonna be very hard to get rid of it. And, and you know, it's, uh, as I said, it may be here, it's just that we haven't found it. Then we have the physical and mechanical control, which is, you know, uh, it's, it's gonna be the traps, it's gonna be smashing it, it's gonna be stamp it, killing it anyway. Uh, then we have a biological control, which is predators and parasitoids. And also uh, we have the chemical control. The chemical control is divided in two. Uh, we call it, one is biorationals and the other one is conventional. Biorationals are chemical compounds composed of natural products, including animals, plants, microbes, and minerals, or their derivatives. And also within that, biological control is a, it finds its place. Uh, you see the cultural pro, uh, control is the one that is the less toxic, and we call it prevention. And then as we go up on the pyramid, we are gonna have more toxicity, and also it's gonna be intervention. So this is something that all the farmers know very well, and um, we are gonna be working very hard with them to, to help them uh, choose the best approach for them. But also it's something that we need to learn and uh, include it in our in on management for the spiral lantern flight if we are homeowners. And as I said, master gardeners can help you with that. So 
So when is the time, the time of the year and uh, uh, the, the right treatments that we need to do, uh, we need to follow. And as I said, you know, we know now that the Sparalantifly lantern fly has a life cycle. So based on that life cycle, we are going to have different uh, approaches. So we can scrap the eggs during January and a a April and November and December. Then we can apply dormant oil to egg masses on January, April. Um, we can use sticky and uh, uh, sticky and uh, traps on trunks. We can also use contact insecticides uh, sprays, all May through October, as well as uh, use the drench uh, systemic insecticides and organic sprays. And uh, also, we shouldn't be moving anything that is infested with sparamantra fly. Um, this is a little bit, um, you know, look like the, the previous one, but it's when we're going to do the management options is the control options are done move any life stage. That is, as I said, you know, during the whole year. Um, and I think this is the same that previous one, although this says, it uh, tells you what type of insecticides we can use and mostly it's going to be imidacloprid and dinotefuran. Uh, usually after bloom. Why? These insecticides will kill anything. And uh, during this time of the year, May to October, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, May to August, and um, is when we are going to have a lot of bloom. Uh, also, you, know, you see contact insecticides, uh, May to October, we have many plants blooming during that time. So that is important. As I said, you know, uh, spraying insecticides or pesticides is is a uh, is something that we may do frequently, but uh, we need to be very careful, especially now that we are going to have you know spermatify it, and then the numbers are very high. So this is one mechanical control. Scribe them, take pictures, and report them. This is the circle trap, and is placed on a tree of heaven. And we call it a funnel as well. Uh, this is a trap that I have on one of the farms, and, and this is in Leesburg. Uh, the sticky trap, as you may see, we have a net around that because uh, sticky traps, we're using it on places where it, there is a heavy population or infestation, uh, but also sticky traps uh, may trap a beneficials and small mammals and reptiles and also birds. So if you are going to be using those, we recommend you to use the, the net. Um, the sparrow fly pesticide control, we have um, different approaches. We have insecticides, which can be conventional and organic. In this case, the organic is the bio pesticides. Um, we have parasitoids, which are the ones that will parasitize the egg, and the endemic, the ones that are native, and um, that we can find here, normal and uh, classical. And then we have predators, as par uh, mantis, uh, prey mantis is one, we have seen it eating them. Uh, and then we have the microbial, which can be virus, bacteria, fungi, and protest. Also, you, I want to, um, sorry, let me go back. Um, on this one, you see that there are um, some uh, red, I'm sorry, green uh, squares on the organic parasitoids, microbial, and predators. And those are the ones that we call uh, biopesticides. Uh, this is so extremely important and uh, it's something that we teach not just for sporulantia fly, but for any pest, and when I said pest, weeds are pests, insects, bacteria, um, fungi, everything that we don't want in our garden or in our house, but in this case garden, those are pests. And the pesticide product label is a binding legal agreement between three parties. One is the US Environmental Protection Agency, the other one is the product registrant, and the other, the next one, the last one is us. So the label is the law. You need to read the label before you're applying. 
And, um, you know, we, uh, Master Gardeners and, and my office, we can recommend pesticides, the right pesticide for uh, the problem that you have. And where that, uh, that uh, the insect, in this case, Paralanto fly is, every pesticide that we use have to have in the label the, uh, the problem pest that we are going to control and the plant where that pest is found. So I'm not going to go through each one of these, but it's just to show you that there are alternatives uh, for spiral lantern fly control. However, biopesticides doesn't mean that they are more safe for other insects or, or other uh, living organisms. Most of the time, um, uh, in, well, in this case, we have the biological control, which they are specific, meaning they will just attack uh, a specific uh, insects. In this case, these two strains will attack spiral lantern fly, but they are very expensive and we need to apply them frequently. Um, we have biological predators, but as I said, you know, they, we don't have many of them that will eat them because they don't taste very well. Um, and they are not going to be able to control the population. We have parasitoids, and if you can see, there is a tiny wasp on uh, that spiral lantern fly. Uh, there are some parasitoids that are native in our environment. However, Sometimes it's hard for them. They are uh, solitary insects. And also because we spray a lot of pesticides, uh, you know, for, to control termites, to control ants, we kill them. And in this case, when spiral lantern fly comes here, we are not going to be waiting for them to control them because it's going to be causing economic impact. Uh, so this is something, you know, it's, it's a very, very fine line. Um, of control, which is very important, but uh, you know we need to balance uh, at that moment what is what we need. Uh, these are two endemic parasitoids that have been found, and as I said, you know if you see a, a round hole on a spiral lanternfly egg mass, please report it because that means that there is a parasitoid and this endemic and. Um, the, the researchers will need to know more about that. And you can see that about 20% of the egg mass were parasitized, uh, and this was, this was in Pennsylvania. We also have a type of uh, fungi that has been found. Uh, ho however, in order for these to grow and spread, we need humidity and temp temperature. So, is not something that we can rely on, and or we need to uh, bring those uh, environments to the um, to the fungi for it to develop. We also have some soaps and oils, and um, as I said, we if you if you need information about this, just contact a uh, Loudoun County Master Gardeners. And then here, you just want to say conventionals are those that are, uh, are those chemicals that are uh, made out in, in the lab, totally in the lab. Um, and we have systemics. It means that they move, when we apply them in the leaves, they're going to move through the whole plant, the roots, the stems, the flowers. And then we have a contact insecticides. Um, for, uh, everything is for spiral and fly. So it means that you, when you're spraying, you have to spray that insect, the insect. Otherwise, you are not going to kill it. Um, and there are specific insecticides, contact insecticides that we can use for nymph and adults. And here I told you, you know, somebody said, can we just uh, uh, smash it or squish it? Yes, we can. This is Becky's kill kit and then this is pets kill kit. Um, Dina, I'm sorry, you said something about. Okay, I'll continue. So before starting this one, I want to tell you this is a video that was filmed in Avenger in Pennsylvania in 2017, I think. Uh, as you can see, the spider lantern fly is not eating the fruit. The, the fruit is on the stems and then you're going to see on your left uh, some like a bright light 
that are shooting up. That is this honeydew that is uh, the experimental fly is, is screening. So let me start it. You can see some drops. It's like a, a light showing up on the video. You can see it on the top left. And really, if you are in a place where the spider lanternfly, you can see on the middle, is shooting out. If you're in a place where spider lanternfly is like this, you can feel like that there's rain falling on you. Okay, I'm gonna continue. So the take home message is um, their pesticides are effective. In this case, insecticides are effective to control the spiral light and fly. Uh, if we are talking about a uh, biorationals or organics, it will be the neem oil or insecticidal soaps, although we need to apply it constantly. Uh, there are several predators that uh, can con can attack spiral lantern flies, but they will not control this, the population of spiral lantern flies. So you have seen is is exponentially. Uh, the parasitoid that was used for gypsy moth does the con control spiral lantern fly, but we need to do more research in order than for us to release it and for it to be approved as a biological control. Uh, there are two parasitoids that are currently in quarantine in the United States, and they were brought from China. And there are two fungal pathogens that also attack spiral lantern flight, um, but they need more research in order to, to, to release them. And let me tell you, the research for these biological controls could last till 10 years sometimes. Uh, we have plenty of uh, publications for spiral lantern flight. Uh, you can do you can go to Loudon Gulf spiral lantern flight or Virginia Tech spiral lantern flight, and you will find all the uh, publications. If you cannot find them, you can call us uh, or reach out to us by uh, email uh, at Loudon County Master Gardeners. Also, uh, your observations are important. If you see that spiral lantern flight uh, has been eaten by any uh, birds, uh, please. A report to birds biting that box. Um, it will take all of us to slow the spider lantern flight a, a population. Is we are not going to stop it. We are going to slow it, and hopefully we can find it before established. Um, as we said, integrated pest management is very important. You already know what are the life cycles of this insect, so we know what or we know what to do during each time. Um, and you know you don't have to remember this, but uh, everything. But you know that you can reach out to us, and we can help you with that. Hopefully, now that you learn more about spider lantern fly, you can educate your community and your friends. Um, as I said, spider lantern fly will not eat or bite you or sting you, and um, it will also not need buildings because I, I this was uh, written that like that because when it started, um, the population started growing in Winchester, people were thinking that they will eat the buildings. Um, for control of spiral lantern flight or uh, to, con uh, to kill tree of heaven, we said, you know, please have a licensed professional control. We are going to be using, uh, you know, uh, uh, insecticides uh, uh, and herbicides that are uh, require certain education to use them. Um, as a homeowner, you may you may use some, but uh, as I said, you know, read the label before applying anything. What we have done is uh, we have uh, done public education, uh, a rich since 2018. Um, we have been working with um, the county to support press release reporting uh, capabilities. We have been installing traps since 20, it's 2018, not 2028, it's 2018. And mostly I have done it on a uh, vineyards because uh, most of our agricultural workers are coming from Virginia, from, from Winchester. And as I said, you know, I've been working with them very, uh, every year, educating them and, you know, just talking with them to to teach them how to identify it and uh, to report it. 
Um, as I said, our county is almost surrounded. We need everyone to report any possible sites and contact us, um, me, Master Gardeners, if you would like to volunteer to place um, spider lantern flies in your area. And for more information to report any sites, go to Loudon Golf Spider Lantern Fly. If you would like to volunteer, if you are not sure that this is Spider Lantern Fly, or you want to get a quicker response for Spider Lantern Fly, please go to Loudon Master Gardeners at vt.edu. And you know, this is everything. Uh, do you have any questions? I was looking at the chat box. I, I have been recording the program. Um, I had a couple inquiries as to whether or not your PowerPoint might be available to share. We, you know, the thing is, we would like to, if somebody wants the, the PowerPoint, we would like to know what they want it for. Uh, we prefer to do a education directly if they want that for a you know, to reach out to other people and we would like to work with them. So the best way if they if they do if they'd like the PowerPoint is to contact you directly? Yes, please. Okay. Do you have some contact information that I could put in the chat box or you could put in the chat Be box? Uh, I don't know. Is Becky also co host? Yeah, uh, she's she's on the chat right now. She said to I'm going to type what she's saying. Thank contact you. Contact the help desk for educational material and for any questions that you have with Sparlante Fly. And you know, it's not just Sparlante Fly. Master gardeners are volunteers that will help homeowner homeowners in the way in the same way that I help commercial a uh, uh, um, horticulturists or commercial farmers. Got several good feedback, good info. Thanks, Beth. And somebody said I stayed longer than I should, but I was so fascinated. Thank you so much, Thank Beth. You. Just a fantastic lecture. And Sorry. somebody else said this has been very informative. I appreciate your time to present this evening. Thank you for staying. I think um, I think we're winding down. I don't see any more questions. I've got several thank yous and thank you, Beth. We really do appreciate it. It was a great lecture and very informative. And You're thank you welcome. everybody else for coming as well. Um, and we'll be, we'll continue to do a monthly master gardeners online. So keep your eyes open for upcoming lectures. And this will be, um, the recording will be available. I'm going to send it to Jean Fenwick, who will send it out to the master gardeners. Um, it will probably also be available through the Loudoun County public library YouTube channel, but I'll let Jean know either way. Um, any last questions? I think we're good. Okay, thank well, you so much, Beth. Have a great night and thank you, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Take care.